taking Bitcoin in isolation of you know, putting all the other assets aside. We believe Bitcoin disrupts gold. We think it's a better gold if you look at the properties of money and what makes gold gold scarcity. Bitcoin's actually fixed in supply. It's, it's, so it's better than scarce in gold. It's more portable. It's, more, it's fungible. It's more you know, durable. Um, it sort of equals or better gold across the board. So if you look at a $100 billion market cap today, now last week it might have been more like 200, <laughs> but um, so it's actually a buying opportunity. We think that there's a potential appreciation of 30 to 40 times because you look at the gold market today, it's a $7 trillion market. And so a lot of people are starting to see, they see that, they recognize the store of value properties. Um, so we think regardless of the price moves in the last a uh, few weeks, it's still very, um, a very underappreciated asset. And, and Bitcoin's just the first cut. And if Bitcoin's a better gold, imagine your financial system with only gold as an asset class. Um, that's how sort of early in the beginning of this is. There's going to be a menu of many cryptocurrencies, and they're going to rethink the entire internet and how we sort of view it. Um, you could never buy a piece of the internet back in the 90s. You couldn't buy the protocols. You could buy, you could invest in a VC firm on Santa Road that had to pick Amazon versus pets.com. So you had to get lucky, you had to be very privileged and get lucky um, um, many times to, to get it. Um, now you can just buy a piece of the protocol. So buying Bitcoin is like a call option on the entire B Bitcoin ecosystem. A Bitcoin company will not work out before Bitcoin works out itself first. So the ultimate Bitcoin bet is Bitcoin, or the ultimate Ether, Ethereum bet is Ether. And you're ba basically buying a piece of the racetrack. And you're not picking, you know, Seabiscuit, doesn't matter who wins, as long as the races are running, you, you're a part of it. Um, and that's the beauty here. And usually the retail investors come in at the end. You know, they get dumped this stuff post IPO, um, you know, 10 years after a company was founded. Now retail's been the ones who have been there first. And actually, Wall Street is completely uh, asleep at the wheel and late to the game. Uh, Silicon Valley has actually completely missed it, too. People in Silicon Valley and the companies have maybe personally got it. Some VCs have personally invested in coins, but they structurally were unable to invest, only, had to invest in, in C-Corps. And so buying gold or buying Bitcoin is not something they do, but the partners were investing their own money. And Silicon Valley very much missed cryptocurrency um, because they want to miss it. Um, it, it, it's not good for the centralized application layer, the FANG companies that sit on top of the internet. Cryptocurrencies actually decentralize that, pull it all down to the layer below, the protocol layer, and the value actually accrues to the people who buy into and use and build the network. Not one company, there's not a headquarters of Bitcoin or Ethereum. These are, these are networks that are decentralized and owned by, in a very democratic way, the users. To this point, it's basically been uh, a spot market. And so this is the first time that people can actually express easily a short position on Bitcoin. So what that's going to do is create a truly two-sided market, um, which should reduce volatility in the long term and also increase price discovery and just make it easier for institutions um, and individuals to, to gain access and exposure to Bitcoin. With this contract, because it's cash settled, um, you can buy it with cash and you settle out in cash. So you don't um, have to actually touch the underlying or deal with Bitcoin, but you can get the investment exposure to it. So it's just another financial product, an easier way to get access. We've been working really hard uh, to give Jamie Dimon an opportunity to short Bitcoin. Um, and anybody who says that, you know, it's a fraud or a bubble, you can go now put your money where your mouth is and bet against it. Yeah, I mean, talk is cheap. Um, and that's right. Um, now, now you can actually, like Cameron said, you can bet against this. So we encourage Jamie Dimon, we encourage him to personally bet against this Bitcoin, uh, take JP Morgan's balance sheet, bet, it, bet against Bitcoin. Uh, we'll see what happens. But, yeah. but now they can do it instead of just sort of throwing stones. People are wondering what what Bitcoin is backed by. When I look at the dollar, the dollar is backed by the full faith of the Treasury, the full faith of the U.S. government. What, Cameron, is Bitcoin backed by? 
So it's a great question. Um, so Bitcoin, we think of Bitcoin as gold. And I think if you look at gold, some people point to an intrinsic value of gold, but that really doesn't explain the value of gold. It might explain 10, 15 percent of the actual value of gold. Gold has value because we all agree that it has value and we'll all accept gold. And it has a collective acceptance and, and value that way. Bitcoin, um, in addition to being increasingly accepted around the world and more people coming to the system by the day, um, has the Miner, mining network, which is one of the largest computer networks in the world, and it's backed by cryptography. A lot of people would look at the U.S. dollar or government-backed currencies and say a government in, in has counterparty risk. The average lifespan of a currency is roughly 27 years. Look no further than the Zimbabwe dollar. They have, I think, a trillion dollar bill or Venezuela. The, the history of most currencies is really terrible. Um, and so, yes, living in the U.S., we look at the U.S. dollar and we say, well, what's wrong with that? And it's a pretty decent store of value. But in reality, most fiat currencies out there fail. People use the word bubble. Um, and we this is basically bitcoin's 20th bubble that you know we came in five five years ago remember when bitcoin was a bubble at thirty dollars bitcoin was a bubble at a hundred dollars at five hundred a thousand five thousand ten thousand now we're at a bubble at seventeen thousand um you know gold's been a bubble for thousands of years um, but the bubble framework is really uh, not correct to put against Bitcoin. When you think of a company, a company, right, and their stock price, if they produce X amount of units one year and the same amount of units the next year and the stock price goes up and the economic pro doubles and the economic productivity um, hasn't changed, the cash flows haven't changed with the company, we say that company is overvalued. But Bitcoin is not a company. Um, it is a network. And the value of networks is Metcalfe's law. It's N squared. So the amount of users on a network is, is N. And so if I'm the only person in the world who has a phone, then it's not very valuable. I can't call you. Um, but if you buy a phone, you've actually increased the value of my phone um, inadvertently or not even knowing uh, because now all of a sudden my phone's useful. Same thing with the social network. If you look at Facebook, the first person on Facebook, lonely place, not much to do. All of a sudden, 100 people, you can connect with people. You can share stories, share pictures. That's a good analogy. So it's classic network effects. A billion people on Facebook, that's a billion uh, squared. Right. So that's all of a sudden the value gets exponentially greater. Um, and that's how we value Bitcoin. Money is a network. People believe in the U.S. dollar. It has more value. Um, people believe in Bitcoin. It has value. People believe in gold. It has value. And that's not a linear increase. By definition, the more people that get into Bitcoin, it makes it more valuable. And when we try and take like equities or stock bubble type frameworks to, to Bitcoin, it's really um, it's misguided because it's a network. Have you sold any Bitcoin so far? Uh, well, we definitely we, we purchased uh, tickets to space with Bitcoin a couple of years ago on Virgin Galactic, and we clearly overpaid for that. Um, but look, we believe long term that this is there's still a, lo a long way for Bitcoin's value to go from here. We think that it is gold 2.0 and it's disrupting potentially gold, which is a six trillion dollar market cap. So if you look at Bitcoin today at three hundred billion, it looks like, you know, and it's certainly appreciated quite a bit in the past year. But look, we've been saying this for the past five years when Bitcoin was a hundred, you know, one billion dollar market cap, that Bitcoin is a better gold. If you look at the properties of gold that make gold gold, like, um, you know, scarcity, um, fungibility, divisibility, portability, Bitcoin equals or surpasses gold across each category. So, for example, gold is scarce. Bitcoin is actually fixed. Um, at 21 million. It's divisible into 100 million pieces. It's actually kind of hard to cut up bars of gold um, and they're hard to move. Um, yeah, that's they're true. not nearly as portable. And, and part of this, I think, is a little bit of a generational thing. I hate to say that, but if you talk to millennials or kids on the street, right. they don't want hardware. They want software. They get Bitcoin. There's no explanation necessary. They don't talk about um, wanting to wear Bitcoin or, you know, why isn't Bitcoin shinier? Mm. Um, they, they really, they want a digital, they live in a digital world. They live in a 27, 24-7 uh, uh, world. They're connected all the time. And Bitcoin is money built for the internet that moves like information and email and everything else. Gold is just the old world. Yeah. Um, it, it had its place. Um, it's had a great 3,000 year run um, and Bitcoin, you know, has only been here for 10 years, but it's really, you know, cutting in quite a bit.
Yeah, I mean, say, say like, uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, taking a break from um, the, the real world and going to the online world used to be how things were. Now people take a break from the online world uh, and step into the real world for like, you know, be right back for like 10 minutes. But they're really living most of their lives in a digital world. Are you surprised at this incredible success? I mean, I know that you were early believers, but wow, <laughs> you were right. Yeah, I mean, so when we th first found Bitcoin or first came across it, um, it sounds like a huge idea. It's kind of crazy. And it's it's not crazy to be very skeptical and say sort of like, I think Cameron Burst said, you know, this is either like huge or, or total bull****. Um, we know this was back in 2012, but kept learning, kept talking to people about it, kept asking questions, kept getting incredible answers back. And I just couldn't see how this couldn't work or wouldn't work. Um, maybe that's what makes us like a little bit different. The way we think about things, we're, we're sort of optimists and we want to dig deeper and we want to believe and look for that thing. Um, we obviously get really passionate about it, but you know, again, we really couldn't see how, um, why we wouldn't be sitting here today, five years ago, why we wouldn't be sitting here today talking to you having this, this, um, this conversation. So, um, in ter yeah, we're, you know, that was sort of our, our, our thinking the whole time. I th yeah, I think we always thought it was a binary outcome. Um, it was either zero or potentially, you know, as large as gold or even bigger. Um, maybe we just see the world differently and we're, you know, one of the few that saw it that way, but that's kind of the outcome that we envisioned. And